we are going to hear from Drs. Kirsten Harknett and Daniel Schneider. Let me introduce them to you. Drs. Harknett and Schneider direct the SHIFT project, an ambitious effort to understand how uncertainty in scheduling of work results in economic and health precarity. Within the California Labor Laboratory, Drs. Harknett and Schneider have a project using SHIFT project data and a compendium of policy efforts at the local, state, and federal levels that regulate employment to understand inequalities in service sector employment. Dr. Harknett is a professor of social and behavioral sciences at UCSF. She received her undergraduate degree in sociology from Notre Dame and her doctorate in sociology and demography from Princeton University. Dr. Schneider is a professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard University. He received his undergraduate degree in public policy and American institutions at Brown, and his doctorate was also from Princeton in sociology and social policy. So I have the pleasure of introducing them and having them tell you about shift work and its consequences. Doctors, Dr. Uh, Hartnett, you start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. I'm so pleased to have an opportunity to share some findings from the SHIFT project and to get to follow Jacob Hacker, whose work is a big motivation for our inquiries into precarious work in the US service sector. The uh, SHIFT project um, that Christina introduced and that Danny and I co-direct focuses on job conditions in the service sector where the nature and the conditions of work have transformed rapidly. This has in some ways really been one of the ground zero sites for the great risk shift. And for us, we believe the US service sector is a really important, interesting strategic site. And that's why we've been studying it since 2016. And um, some of the reasons why this is an important place to focus attention. Um, the service sector is large, and these are not just jobs for teenagers. Three and four service sector workers are 25 years and older. One in three service sector workers are combining work and parenting. To give a little bit more sense of the size and scope of the service sector as a part of the US economy, um, the service sector, including retail, food service, hospitality, employs 17% of the entire US labor force. And that is as much as the manufacturing and the construction sectors combined. And that's a greater share than is employed in education or healthcare sectors. And over on the right on this slide, we can see over the past several decades that on the top, employment in retail has grown rapidly. On the bottom, um, employment in food service has grown rapidly. Now, both these sectors took a big hit during the pandemic, but they've mostly rebounded. So when we think service sector, we think large and growing. Another reason why this is a strategic and important site, during the pandemic, there was new appreciation for the essential nature of service sector work and just how essential these jobs are for our economy. Um, when many workers in the beginning of the pandemic were told to just stay home, service sector workers in grocery and pharmacy delivery kept reporting to work and, and, and kept meeting our basic needs. Um, this slide features a couple of these essential frontline heroes um, employed in the grocery sector. And importantly, service sector jobs are often the quintessential bad jobs where workers earn low wages, they have few fringe benefits, many are um, involuntarily working part-time and subject to just-in-time scheduling practices. And this is really a recipe for the earnings volatility um, that Jacob Hacker showed for the US as a whole has really been increasing, um, but it's especially prevalent among service sector workers. And all of these things combine, these job conditions combine, they're a recipe for material hardships and economic insecurity. So in our survey data, just before the pandemic, we saw that over a quarter of service sector workers reported hunger hardship in the prior year. Almost a quarter said it was very difficult to pay their bills in the prior month. And worryingly, 
43% of these workers said that they would not be able to cope with a $400 expense shock right before a gigantic shock in the form of the pandemic struck. And when we think about job quality and precarity in the service sector, it's important to recognize that it goes beyond just hourly wages. When we pose the question directly to workers, what's important um, for a good job? You know, a lot of workers do say level of pay. 60% say that the level of pay is very important. But just as many, just as large a share, say that predictable work hours are very important for a good job. And an even greater share, 70%, say that stable and predictable pay is very important. And so this multifaceted nature of job quality is really important. Uh, it's an important theme in our work. And so although we've seen some progress in hourly wages increasing here for retail workers, the other side of the equation is that weekly work hours have actually declined over time for these workers. And since they're paid by the hour, um, these declines in hours are really gonna offset gains in hourly wages. And moving even one step beyond just the number of hours that workers can expect, there's a great deal of volatility in work schedules. Um, the expectations of the 24 seven economy are such that workers have to keep their schedules wide open for work at virtually any time. Employers often take an algorithmic approach to work scheduling, aiming to really closely align staffing and demand to minimize labor costs. And as a result, workers contend with a great deal of routine uncertainty. And as um, Jacob Hacker has described in The Great Risk Shift, many of the risks of business uncertainty fall upon the workers themselves. So if business is slow, then workers shifts will get canceled um, and they will bear the risk of um, that, that slowdown. Pay and hours for these workers are not guaranteed. And this chronic uncertainty, as Danny will talk about, really exacts a brutal toll on workers. But some of what makes service sector jobs so very precarious is not well measured in existing data sets. And that's really been the impetus for the SHIFT project to go out and collect our own data from thousands of service sector workers over several years to learn about a fuller set of job conditions at particular com uh, companies and in particular geographies, we collect data at a large scale. So we've got survey data nationally from service sector workers, some oversamples in strategic geographies, and importantly, our data from service sector workers are nested within named companies, allowing us to compare and contrast company practices. We gather this data um, by harnessing targeted advertising on Facebook and Instagram, where we can go out and recruit workers who are employed at particular companies. Workers see these advertisements targeted to a worker like them, naming their company and trying to make the picture look like a worker at their workplace. And if they click on the ad, they'll be directed to a Qualtrics survey where they're asked to tell us about their job conditions and their health and their economic security and their families. And we've been able to amass really an enormous amount of data over a period of about seven years um, from about 160,000 workers at 145 large companies. To give you a little bit of a sense of who's in the data, um, big retail food service, hospitality and logistics companies are represented in our data. And um, this gives you a snapshot of um, the repeat cross-sectional waves in yellow that we've collected 11 of. And then in green, we've got some embedded um, panel data. And so now I will hand the reins over to Danny, who will give you a sense of uh, how we've deployed these data to learn more about conditions in the service sector. Great. Uh, thanks, Kristen, and, and thanks, everyone. I guess I'll take the slide handoff here. Okay, uh, Kristen, can you see these slides? I see you. Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, well, one of the first purposes that we had 
uh, upon collecting this data was to really understand the, the experience of work schedule instability and unpredictability in the service sector to really advance our understanding beyond the, the quite limited set of measures that existed in sort of mainstream and standard data sources and to pick up the richness of this experience using the new measures that we developed in SHIFT. And what we find is honestly sobering. Workers in the service sector experience widespread instability and unpredictability. The days of a regular day shift are long gone. Uh, of an eight to four or nine to five, but so are the days of a regular evening shift or a night shift. Instead, workers experience a great deal of instability and unpredictability in their schedules. Um, and these schedules are often uh, published with very little advance notice. So what we find is that uh, about a third of workers report getting less than one week's notice of their schedules, and uh, another third get just one to two weeks notice. So just Two, so two thirds of workers are getting less than two weeks notice of what their work schedule will be. But even once published, many uh, schedules are subject to change at the last minute, but generally only by management. So a quarter of workers report working on call shifts. Two thirds of workers report having their schedules changed at the last minute, asked to come in early or stay late depending on customer demand. What we really see here is what uh, Professor Hacker talked about with the risk shift. Here we see the transfer of risk from employer payrolls who might be asked to bear the cost of employee hours when they're not strictly needed on the floor to household balance sheets in which workers hours are cut or extended at the last minute so that employers can closely match staffing with customer demand. That may make uh, good logic for the business for the business's bottom line on a day to day basis, but it is unmistakably this risk shifting behavior. These kinds of unstable schedules go hand in hand with insufficient hours. Workers report, in fact, almost a third of them report not getting as many hours as they'd like at their main jobs. In this part of the labor model, employers are often keeping large staffs of part-time workers available to be called in when needed. But by, by spreading those hours among many employees, they keep employees eager for hours, but often with insufficient hours for any one employee. Um, finally, I want to emphasize that what we really see clearly in the data is that this is instability, not flexibility, or at least not flexibility from the employee standpoint. Workers tell us they have little control over their schedules and that they'd like a more stable schedule. Instead, what we see is that, again, employers have flexibility to deploy labor exactly when needed, not that employees have the flexibility that, as Professor Hacker mentioned, we, they might want given work-life conflicts and changing family structures. Does it matter? A lot of our work has really been concerned with trying to use the shift project data to look and see how workers fare when they're exposed to unstable and unpredictable schedules. How they fare when exposed to unpredictable schedules compared to workers with the same wages, in the same occupations, honestly working at some of the same employers. And what we see is really stark. We find in a series of papers that workers who experience more schedule instability and unpredictability report significantly higher levels of material hardship, of going hungry because they couldn't afford enough to eat, of not being able to get medical care that they needed or having to defer that care because of the cost, of not being able to keep up with their regular utility bills. This happens both because schedule instability breeds income volatility, which is a difficult stressor when it comes to making ends meet, but also because coping with such unstable practices is simply depleting of, of, of mental resources, of planning resources, of social networks. It makes it hard to qualify for social welfare benefits. All in all, these kinds of unstable schedules really bleed a kind of, breed a kind of family chaos. And we see that take shape in workers' own reports of their well-being, where workers who have more unstable and unpredictable schedules, seen here across the x-axis, also report higher levels of unhappiness, worse sleep quality, and more psychological distress when adjusting for a whole host of potentially confounding characteristics. And such schedules also appear to have intergenerational consequences. Workers who uh, work on stable and unpredictable schedules um, often have children um, who would thrive on regular routines and stable care arrangements, but for whom it is difficult to provide these basics of developmental parenting given the schedules their parents face. Kids whose parents have more unstable schedules manifest more internalizing behavior and more externalizing behavior. 
if schedules instability is so widespread and poses such problems for families, what can we do about it? One school of thought suggests that companies might be uh, uh, encouraged, induced, or shamed into taking a high road approach. That there's another way, another profitable business strategy that doesn't involve such dramatic risk shifting, such deeply unstable and unpredictable schedules. Um, but it's hard to know what individual companies are actually doing and whether what we have seen is simply a race to the bottom in which all companies inevitably have these really unstable and unpredictable schedules or whether there is space in the business case for more high road approaches. And that's another unique feature of the shift data that we've really begun to mine recently, to really go inside the black box of these large firms to understand what workers are experiencing and how it differs across firms, if at all. One place we've done this is in a recent collaboration with the Economic Policy Institute, where we've released the company wage tracker just a, a few weeks ago. Using the shift data, we're able to look inside these firms and chart average wages, but also the full wage distributions for hourly workers at each of these named firms. And we can make some really telling comparisons that give some credence to the notion that there is a higher road strategy available. For instance, we can compare wages at a company like Kroger and another grocer like Whole Foods, where half of Kroger workers earn under 15. That's true for just 1% of Whole Foods workers. Perhaps even dr more dramatically, we can compare McDonald's workers, where 90% earn less than $15 an hour, um, to workers at In-N-Out Burger, uh, where just 9% earn under 15. So if, if the much more delicious hamburgers available to you Californians weren't enough reason to go to In-N-Out, here too you can see uh, uh, the difference in how workers' job quality shapes up. But the data are also really telling with regard to schedules. And here we see enormous heterogeneity between these firms, all in the service sector, in their scheduling practices. Where at firms like Family Dollar and Victoria's Secret and Waffle House, more than half of workers, for instance, report an on-call shift in the last month. But that share falls much lower, approaching under 10%, even 5% at firms like Trader Joe's and Ikea, you know, even, even Hobby Lobby. Um, and so there's a lot of heterogeneity here. It's not just heterogeneity that occurs between subsectors, however. Even within a, a sector like general merchandise, we see substantial variation between firms in their business practices. So is there then scope for a higher road approach? And I, I think one sort of mark in favor of this argument is the business roundtables sort of now, now well-known statement a couple of years ago, encouraging its members, sort of, in fact, staking out the proposition that its members would be driven not just by producing shareholder value, but by the interests of a broader set of stakeholders, including employees. If there was ever a moment when this kind of uh, a philosophical change might instantiate in changes in job quality, it was the pandemic, and maybe even it was the uh, extraordinarily uh, and surprisingly tight labor market we find ourselves in today. If, 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 if recognizing frontline heroes and a global pandemic wasn't enough, then perhaps attracting workers and, and the economic logic uh, of, of tight labor markets would push firms onto this higher road approach. We've been tracking that over the past several years. Uh, and what we find is sobering, frankly, and, and a little disappointing. We just don't find any evidence that firms are voluntarily embracing a more stable and predictable scheduling model. Cancellations, clopenings, on-call shifts and timing changes remain really common and honestly at a pretty steady rate in the service sector across and through this global pandemic. Firms really have baked these practices into their business models. Uh, the ability to schedule workers exactly when needed is really fundamental to how service sector firms operate. What can move these practices, if not this kind of voluntary action and pledges? And here we think there's a really important role for not just encouraging firms to the high road, but for raising the floor on job quality through enhanced labor standards. Uh, we're all familiar with the higher minimum wages that have been passed in cities and states around the country, honestly, with with more jet, with, jet, with paid sick leave provisions that have been in place in many cities and states, and now paid family and medical leave provisions. But alongside these more progressive labor standards on wages and paid time off, have also been a set of laws that require more stable and predictable schedules for workers at exactly the same set of large service sector firms that we study in the shift project. 
not coincidentally that we started studying these firms. Um, and we have seen laws that require employers in the sector to give workers at least two weeks advance notice and that regulate last minute changes and provide a measure of pay and compensation for workers time pass in San Francisco, in Seattle, in Philadelphia, in Chicago, in New York City, in the state of Oregon, and what laws that continue to be in place play in, in, politically in cities and states around the country. We set out partnering with the uh, uh, Office of the City Auditor in, in Seattle to estimate the effects of Seattle's secure scheduling law way back in 2017. Seattle's law, really following the model of many of the laws that have passed before and since around the country, requires two weeks advance notice to service sector workers of what their schedules will be, and then pro provides for predictability pay when schedules are changed at the last minute or a shift is canceled by an employer. It doesn't outlaw schedules that change from week to week. It doesn't forbid employers from making last minute changes, but it does provide for a recognition that employees' time has value. And it does provide for compensation then to workers when these changes happen at the last minute. Of course, it may be that that compensation is sufficient to discourage these practices. And that's exactly what we wanted to understand. And then to understand if these changes would have downstream effects on workers. To do this, we collected data using the sort of rapid response infrastructure of the shift project um, right before the law went into effect in 2017, the first set of blue uh, bars as in Seattle for covered workers, as well as a set of workers at the exact same firms, but in places around the country that were not covered by secure scheduling laws. We then followed up twice after the law went into effect in July 1 of 2017, in 2018 and in 2019. We wanted hourly workers employed at the large firms who were covered by the law in Seattle or in comparison cities, where these comparison cities um, were constructed out of the national data to also capture a large metro area like Seattle, and that also had a progressive labor environment, specifically a higher than federal minimum wage as Seattle did at the time. The results I'll show you are for these comparison groups. We test a number of alternative comparison groups, and we find really striking consistency across all these alternative measures. The basic logic of the approach is that we don't quite have an experiment. We didn't go in and, all, and randomly change people's schedules, but we have a natural experiment. We have a policy experiment. And the way to estimate the effects of this policy experiment is essentially to look at the baseline before implementation practices that workers experience in Seattle, to what happens after the law, and then compare any change there to the change we see in cities that didn't have these laws. The difference, the difference in the differences is the estimated impact of the secure scheduling ordinance in Seattle. And what we find is that the law had a significant effect. It significantly reduced the share of Seattle workers who weren't getting two weeks notice by 10 percentage points or almost a 20% change. And it also significantly uh, reduced the share of workers who were experiencing last minute shift changes without pay. These were the intended effects of the law and they were large and significant differences. Providing workers with more advanced notice and more schedule stability mattered for workers' health and well being. And we estimate significant positive impacts of the law on workers' happiness and sleep quality and reductions in the share of workers experiencing material hardship. Um, Seattle's law remains in effect and we find positive effects of it. But we also find that it was far from eliminating unstable and unpredictable scheduling practices broadly in the sector. There's a big lift to continue to educate employers and workers about their rights so that Seattle and other cities can effectively drive enforcement of these labor standards. Um, there are other laws on the books in other cities around the country. Um, there are other cities and states considering laws, and there is federal legislation that's been introduced by Senator Warren and Representative DeLauro, who we heard about earlier, um, that we hope one day we'll, we'll see re real hearing and consideration uh, in the House and Senate. Uh, with that, let me pass it back to Kristen to talk about some of our other work that, that follows in this vein, but goes a bit broadly from, from, schedule, from scheduling. Thanks, Danny. Do you want to stop? Yeah, thanks. All right, um, so thanks a lot to Danny for uh, sharing the work on scheduling and queuing up, you know, a, a, this idea of 
what can be done and what are some levers or avenues for change? Um, in uh, our last couple of minutes, I just wanted to share uh, some of what we've learned on a really pressing topic during a pandemic, which is just the large share of workers who lack access to paid sick leave. And oops, there we go. Um, as with schedules and wages, we also see that with paid sick leave, there's an enormous amount of heterogeneity across companies. Overall, about half of service sector workers don't have paid sick leave, um, but it varies a great deal. And one example in the grocery sector, um, almost no workers at Dollar General have paid sick leave, but almost every worker at Costco does. And so in this situation where employers are left to their own devices, many take a low road approach and many workers are left without paid sick leave. As we heard earlier, the US really stands out among rich democracies in lacking a federal guarantee to paid sick leave. So as Danny is sometimes fond of saying, there ought to be a law. Um, and in fact, during the pandemic, there was some um, legislation, some movement um, to expand paid sick leave through the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. But unfortunately, there was an enormous loophole and large companies were exempted. So none of the large retail or food service or hospitality employers in our study um, were covered by this expansion of paid sick leave. And so then left to their own devices, many employers chose not to offer it. Now, one of the companies that wasn't offering paid sick leave got called out by an investigative journalist. Um, so Olive Garden was called out for during a pandemic, not offering paid sick leave to their workers and put under pressure to change, um, change their policy. And in fact, overnight, literally, they announced that they would start offering paid sick leave. Now, companies often don't follow through on their proclamations and their promises. And we know that from past experience in our um, shift project study. Um, and because we collect data from Olive Garden workers over time, we were able to take a look before and after this announcement to see whether Olive Garden followed through. And in this case, they did follow through on um, their promise. So in the green line, we saw that there was this huge increase in Olive Garden workers getting access to paid sick leave after the policy changed, an astounding 50 percentage point increase, whereas other food service employers, there was really no change at all. And what's more, when Olive Garden was pressured to expand paid sick leave, Another benefit was that their workers were less likely to go to work while sick. So it was good for their workers, but it was also good for their patrons and for public health. And so our, you know, our data, ongoing data collection allowed us to show, um, to, to hold a company accountable or, or show when they did follow through and then also show the consequences of an expansion of paid sick leave. And the journalist who spurred this action took a victory lap at the end with an article that said, there's proof here that change is possible. But from our you know, gathering of data from many, many companies, not just this one, we can also show that unfortunately change was limited. And if we look overall across the whole service sector before and during the pandemic, we see pretty much a, a flat line um, where before and during the pandemic, about half of service sector workers continue to lack access to paid sick leave. So that's the end of the results that we wanted to share from the SHIFT project on um, precarious work conditions across multiple dimensions. And zooming out to the big picture, we do see a great deal of precarity. We see that companies vary a lot, but often take a low road approach when they're not required to do more. So just to, to just think a little bit about what's next and what can be done. We are at this historic juncture where we've seen more um, bargaining power than workers have had in a long while. And we've seen some movement, some rumblings at a federal level to um, improve conditions to raise the floor um, on wages, paid sick leave, and scheduling regulations. But, you know, absent that federal action, we will 
we should expect to continue to see a patchwork of policies where a lucky few are covered either because their city or their state took action or their company decided to take a high road approach, but many, many will be um, left without protections and with precarious conditions. And so in the meantime, you know, our hope in doing this research and in talking about it is that perhaps we can help to you know, shed a light on the precarious conditions that so many workers face. So it's not just the Olive Gardens taking a high road and saying, yes, we will expand paid sick leave, but there are many others who don't um, follow suit. And so our hope is that by documenting precarious conditions locally, um, that might spur some policy action at a local level. And by documenting company practices and showing that there is another way, there is a higher road approach that profitable companies can and do take, though it's rare, it happens, um, that might um, produce some momentum for company action that may improve conditions for some workers. Um, so I am looking forward to hearing from the rest of the panelists about their research and policy work and the actions that it might spur. And I will just end by thanking all of our funders who made this work possible, many collaborators and you for your attention. And we will look forward to any questions or comments that you have. Terrific presentations. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm uh, anxious to see how this work continues to evolve and uh, look at the kinds of factors that um, we need to pay attention to to change the direction of this, uh, of this result. And one thing that occurs to me, and uh, we'll get to Q&A in just a second, is that uh, having been in many of the service sector companies that you named here, uh, one of the the questions I had when I was observing people working in those uh, situations was about the labor scheduling system itself. It's created by industrial engineers. These are systems that are uh, software systems that are created by several companies bought by these employers uh, in order to uh, make a very tight fit between uh, anticipated business flow and uh, labor spending. Uh, managers, uh, assistant managers and man store managers of these units are held to their labor costs that are projected um, on a year, um, a year to year comparison. Like what is the anticipated business today compared to a year ago? Um, so the problem that I, that I see in this as you know, a, a causal factor is this labor scheduling system that optimizes too much. And, uh, and with the thought that these uh, labor scheduling systems actually work, but what happens is it under staffs and over staffs uh, regularly because business flow is volatile. Uh, and when it's, overstaffed people get sent home. When it's understaffed, uh, they often don't bring people in unless it's uh, severely understaffed. And then you run into problems with having managers doing the work that the workers would have done if they were on staff. So let me just ask uh, the question, is there a partnership here with, um, with business uh, owners where, uh, we can collaborate in terms of what are the costs, both in terms of penalties resulting from legislation and costs with respect to a loss of business because the business has to close, because there aren't workers there. Uh, you know, do you see any future in, beyond um, you know, policy and legislation? I'm sure Danny and I both have a lot to say about that. I can um, kick off and say that, you know, we can document a huge number of consequences of unstable, unpredictable schedules for workers. And we've done that and for their kids, but also there are negative consequences for employers. 
unstable and insecure and unpredictable volatile schedules lead to turnover, which is costly for employers and probably undermine workers' productivity. Um, this obsession with aligning staffing and demand, I think one could argue, is really just is focusing on one thing and missing a lot of other important things like how rested and uh, happy are your workers is going to affect their sales and your revenue. And I think, though, an another thing like going to one last higher level, I think we also have to recognize that there are even beyond just for the company's bottom lines, negative externalities to these practices. Short staffing leads workers to work while sick, even with COVID, and it's terrible for public health. And so I think we really need to continue to beat the drum that there are consequences at all these different levels. And perhaps I'll turn it over to Danny to talk about partnerships or anything else I might've missed. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a, Krista makes a great point that we sort of uh, assume that if business is doing it, it must be optimized. But I think there's a lot of evidence that this really reflects a very short term perspective, even from a business case side, and that there are really longer term benefits um, that may be harder to, you know, to, to account for exactly uh, 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 on the revenue side, but, but, are, but seem to be present. You know, one promising approach um, is to see if this technology can be adapted. As you said, uh, Christina, it, you know, it wasn't necessarily designed with workers in mind, but, but could it be? And we have a partnership with IKEA USA right now where we're working with them to try out some different scheduling software approaches. One of which is to give workers much more uh, schedule control and flexibility, to give workers the ability to say when they are and aren't available, which is something that honestly many service work workers lack now when you're hired. You say, I'm available anytime if you wanna get hired, and then employers hold you to it. And what we're also working on with, with IKEA is the ability for workers to swap shifts much more easily and without managerial approval. So when something does come up, as we know it always does, workers would be able to go into an app and swap a shift with a coworker or pick up an open shift that comes along that works for them. This is not going to be a complete solution. Honestly, IKEA is already an employer that did a lot of more stable and predictable scheduling than many, although not so much on the schedule control and flexibility side. But the possibility here is that algorithms might be designed sort of more equitably um, and, and in a more participatory manner that would give workers some more schedule flexibility and stability while not you know, totally uh, 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 asking worker, employers to revert to you know, rigid set schedules. Yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of work here to be done to um, just explain what are the connections between revenue, reputation, um, worker availability, um, you know, labor pool and all that, and then uh, these schedules. So I, I just really applaud this work. It's terrific. Uh, so we have a question here. Uh, there are some exceptions, but there does seem to be a strong relationship between the income of the top target consumers e.g. Uh, general, Dollar General for poor customers versus Whole Foods for wealthier ones and the working conditions and wages. Is this a systematic effect? No, I think it's a really good observation and I'm impressed that you're able to parse that from these very small value labels. You know, I think this is the question is, can everyone take the high road? Or are, is what we're seeing here fundamentally different business models? And in a way, Costco is the extreme example, right? Where Costco has a very high per transaction market basket price in the hundreds of dollars. It also has fairly lean staffing because things are not carefully displayed. They appear basically on pallets in a warehouse itself. Um, and Costco has really good jobs, the best in the sector. And so, you know, is that kind of model obtainable? by a company like Dollar General or you know, Family Dollar or McDonald's. And you know, I think it's a, it's a legitimate concern. One response is that it's not necessarily clear how expensive more stable and predictable schedules are. It's clear that health insurance is pretty expensive. Perhaps that's something that ought to be done with a public option. 
Um, uh, it, it, wages cost something that's very real, although even among firms selling the same thing, hamburgers, we see a lot of variation on wages. But perhaps schedules are a place where the high road approach is actually quite economically possible, perhaps less constrained by the kind of market basket size or store layouts. Um, and maybe even, a win-win for business if we really reduce turnover at a time when every business is desperate to do so, if we can improve uh, uh, worker morale and lead to more sales at a time when that's got to be your case for brick and mortar stores over online. And so I think actually uniquely with schedules, this argument may be less of a sort of fatal flaw to the high road approach. So there is another factor that might be entering into this, which is the volatility of the demand for business. So the, the business uh, flow volatility. So we might be able to see that uh, there's a correlation between the uh, volatility and uh, the, uh, the unpredictability of schedules, because that's what these scheduling uh, programs do is, uh, you know, they overshoot and undershoot because of, you know, variations in the business flow. So, but that, that change in the business flow has a lot to do with the staffing. You know, how long is the line um, to, yeah. to get to yeah. the transaction? So uh, it, it just seems like it's just rich and uh, for exploration here. There's you one know, more. Uh, Go ahead. Our please. colleague Susan Lambert has a great graph where she plots the volatility of workers' hours, every worker in a store, and then she has a line for the volatility in customer flow. And the workers' lines look like this. And the customer flow line looks like this. So it, it's has more going on here than just responding to demand, right? Or just business imperative. There's real room though for change. Sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna add one other. Uh, reaction, which is that nobody can go full throttle all the time. And this notion that you can't have a tiny bit of extra labor, you know, if it's slow, you've got to send somebody home right away. That is just not a very sustainable employment practice. None of, I don't think any of us would tolerate that no downtime whatsoever. We see a lot of workers feel pressure to work through their legally mandated breaks because they're short staffed and there's just too much work to do. And so I think also this, this really narrow notion that we've got to align staffing with demand. Well, you know, it's not the end of the world if you have a worker who's got a moment to catch their breath and maybe fold something or tidy up the workplace. And some companies will find things, you know, productive things for workers to do um, if they have a little bit of slack once in a while. Absolutely. So uh, a final question before we go to break is from Jacob Hacker. How does monopsony story fit in here? Uh, it is notable that there are very large employers. Want me to start? I'll start because uh, I like the question. Yeah, you know, um, I think it's interesting and I think so monopsony here is the idea that we often think about monopoly, that, um, that, that when firms really corner a market, they can uh, raise prices on customers and really disadvantage customers. With monopsony, it's a sort of similar idea, but we're worried about workers, that when firms really corner the market on jobs in an area, they have a lot of market power and they can push artificially push down wages um, or other you know, aspects of job quality because they're the only game in town. If Walmart comes in and every store on Main Street closes up and there's just the Walmart out on the highway, that's a lot of power for Walmart. Now we think such monopsonistic conditions are probably much more likely in certain kinds of places than others. It might be less common to have a sort of monopsonistic employer in a place like San Francisco or Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, than in smaller, more rural, more isolated areas. Um, and that's something we cover in the data. So there's actually a nice possibility in the data to look and see and try to estimate some effects of monopsony by, by finding the places where we really do seem like that Walmart is the only game in town and compared to a Walmart that's not the only game in town. Um, and to do that, we have the ability to match workers with the exact store they work in. That's something we've been working on with the survey. Um, and then we can sort of geocode all that and understand what are the stores around this, this respondent store 
maybe there's nobody else in town, maybe that would suggest lower wages for that worker than we might otherwise expect. So I don't have, a, I have an answer that's, I agree with your question and we have the same question, but I don't have an answer that says, and we've done it and here's what we find. Great. So uh, we will end here because we now have a 15 minute break, but uh, I think uh, everyone who's attending today and I uh, are applauding the great presentations of all our speakers. And thank you so much, Kristen and Daniel. What a great uh, presentation. So everybody take a break. We'll be back in 15 minutes. We'll reconvene with our next speaker, Dr. John Schwartzberg.